Welcome to Otter Creek Online. In just a few minutes, you're joining us virtually for our worship experience. But before we do that, we wanted to take a moment to acknowledge that some of you joining us each week online are longtime members of the Otter Creek family. And some of you are new to this online Otter Creek experience. You may even be watching from a different state today. We want you to know that our leadership team has a strong desire to know who you are. We want to know what you care about. We want to know what you're interested in spiritually. We want you to know that we want to know how we can help you grow. So here's what we want you to do very practically. If you're watching live through YouTube or Facebook, would you put something in the comment section telling us how we can reach out to you? We have a lot of ways of knowing metrics, but we don't know who you are in the online community. If you're not watching live, you're watching later in the week, would you send an email to our community life minister, james at ottercreek.org. He will get back with you. But our desire, just like with our Brentwood campus and our West End campus, our desire is to know who we're serving and how we can serve you better in the weeks to come. Thanks for joining us online and we hope to hear from you soon. Good morning, good morning Otter Creek. We are so thankful that you are with us this morning. So thankful you have chosen to be uh, with us in this room. If you are a first time guest, we welcome you. Uh, we are honored by your presence. We would love it if you would scan that QR code on the pew in front of you and let us know a little bit about you and, and how you ended up here. Um, I also want to remind us or, or, or inform you maybe, uh, there's an effort that started amongst some volunteers here at this church to uh, initiate name tags out in the foyer at the round table, in the gathering room at the round table. And we would love to encourage connection and welcoming by saying stop by there on your way in one Sunday and put on a name tag. Uh, so that, that space is there that we're going to try to make that available on a regular basis for this community. We, we again want to welcome you to Otter Creek. We are a family growing to be like Jesus. And, and that growth looks different uh, along the way. Sometimes it looks like we are growing deeper in our connections with one another, but it also is numerically. And, and every month we like to acknowledge those who have said, I want to be a part of this church, and I want to be a part of this family. And so we're welcoming our new members today to this new family. People that want to grow together recognize we are better off together than apart. Our membership process at OC is really simple. It's a couple of classes, a couple pieces of information. We're not going to quiz you or make you take a test. We just want to, you to acknowledge this is who you want to journey with, and these are the people you want to travel with. So we give glory to God and praise these new individuals, uh, praise God for these new indiv individuals and families, all of whom bear the image of God and bear gifts of the Creator and new voices that can be used in this community here. So if any of these families are in this room, in a moment, you can stand up with us. We're going to ask them to stand as we pray over them. But we're going to pray over them, eyes up, where we're looking at the screen and you're seeing their faces and praying with us over these families as, as we unite ourselves under this God that is a Trinitarian God, a God of relationship that designed us in that way. So if you're one of those families or individuals, you can stand up and we will pray over these families. So we pray to a God who exists in relationship, Father, Son, and Spirit. May you, God, bless these new members with belonging, with friends, and with open arms from the family here at Otter Creek. Be with Mark and Margot Black. Be with Andrew Butcher. Be with Noah Jones. Be with Craig Lyon. Be with Gail and Lee Maddox. Be with Connor and Sarah Pinson. And be with Penny Reif. And Father, Son, Spirit, may we as a church be ready to welcome and to learn from these new members as they share their life with us. Thank you for the way you reveal yourself to us through each and every face we meet. Through Jesus Christ we pray together. Amen. Now, if you see one of those new families, which a lot of them are in second service, I don't even know if, or in first service, I don't know if anybody even stood up out here. Um, but if you see a new family or you see someone you don't know, you've got two minutes. This is some people's favorite part. I'm joking. This is a lot of people's least favorite part of worship other than Matt Milligan. So stand up and go give a fist bump, go give a hug and greet some people around you. Prove to them this is a welcoming place. Let's make some connection. You got a couple minutes to show your smiling face to somebody. Ready? Go. People hate, people hate this so much and I love it. I love it. 
Good morning, church family. It is so good to be together this morning and to be gathered to worship our God. We are going to start out this morning with a song that may be new for some of you, but we hope that you find it really singable and easy to jump in. Let's stand and worship God together. This song is forever 
This is a reading from the Psalms. Be exalted, O God, above the heavens. Let your glory be over all the earth. My heart, O God, is steadfast. My heart is steadfast. I will sing and make music. Awake my soul, awake harp and lyre. I will awaken the dawn. I will praise you, Lord, among the nations. I will sing of you among all the peoples. For great is your love reaching to the heavens. Your faithfulness reaches to the skies. Be exalted, O God, above the heavens and let your glory be over all the earth.
speak for nobody else but myself when I say that the only way that I have been able to navigate faith and doubt in my adult life is to live in the tension of the inherent paradoxes of life. And if you crave certainty, Christianity can be really frustrating. Like the Christianity that Jesus represents, not the commercialized, sanitized version, but the actual authentic movement that stems from the life and the ministry of Jesus is full of death and resurrection, despair and hope, cynicism and joy. It's probably why my internal meter doesn't trust people who lives on the edges. Like if you're just, everything's awesome all the time, there's no room for lament, everything in life is supposed to be amazing, I will just kind of slowly back away in my spirit. But if you're also a person who thinks that cynicism is a spiritual gift, and it's not, I've checked the New Testament, if like your gift in life is sarcasm, I also just kind of back away too, because I think life is so beautiful, it's so good. And it is that inherent tension of death and life, crucifixion and resurrection that has sustained me in my adult journey of being a person of faith. It's the thing that I want most for my children. I hope it's what you want for your children and grandchildren to pass down a faith that can be sustainable in a chaotic world that we live in. A faith that is not grasping to know everything, to worship at the idol of certainty, but a faith that can be tested, forged, and even emerge stronger in the midst of difficulty and challenge. When I was talking with some different leaders in our church about April and May and talking about faith and doubt and what some call deconstruction and reconstruction, what some just call spiritual maturity, like just letting go of some of the simplistic versions of God that were good for us in our childhood, but don't really cut it when you get into your adult life. Uh, One of the ideas that emerged in that conversation was that we find space for our sister, Pat Ward, to lead us to the table. For those of you who know Pat, you know the gift of prayer and encouragement that God has given her and how she has mentored most of us especially with the gift of encouragement. We found out recently in her journey with cancer that her doctor was concerned about her immune system being compromised, so her doctor has asked her not to be in large gatherings of people. And I sensed a little discouragement in her because we were talking about how she might share communion and her journey in the midst of this series. And then we remembered COVID. We did everything on video, remember that? (laughs) And so our sister, Pat Ward, is going to lead us to the table. And I want you to know, because I know some people who are here for the very first time today, I want you to know that the reason we take communion in our tradition is not simply out of obedience, as if God is some arbitrary judge who likes to hand out rules. The reason we are so dogmatic about the practice of communion is that communion, the bread and the wine, it's what brings us in connection to each other and in connection with God. And Pat says this so beautifully. Let's let her lead us to the table. Communion, it's a time we come together to remember and to celebrate. We remember that God came to earth and became a human. And for 33 years, he stayed human. He made sure he felt everything we would ever feel so that he could intercede on our behalf with empathy. He chose to suffer great things because of his great love for us. He died and rose again. I'm gonna pause, hoping I get a hallelujah. He died and rose again. As we share communion, I pray we walk away from the table committed to share not only communion, but community. It will be risky and vulnerable. Are you ready? Are you willing to let go of your facade? It's scary, but it feels so good on the other side and it's worth it. I was diagnosed with cancer. You know, when you hear the C word, life takes a different turn. Not necessarily a bad one, but a different one. You hear and you feel and you think and you act differently. I recently listened to Stephen Colbert 
and Anderson Cooper have a conversation which has impacted me greatly. Some of the things you hear me say today, we'll be quoting them. I've lost my hair and I have a few other side effects, but it's not anything many of you haven't gone through and shown the glory of Jesus all the way through. We share communion, we share community. We share life because he never meant for us to do this alone. Iron sharpens iron. I need to find peace in my grief. I'm a different person because God is using this process to reform Pat Ward. Supposedly important things have lost their status for me. I'm not alone because God suffered. I'm not alone because many of you have suffered and our suffering will, if we let it, bind us together tighter than we've ever imagined. I recently had a conversation with a trusted friend about Romans 8:28. You know, all things work together for good to those who love the Lord. There's nothing good about losing a spouse or a parent or a parent being left to raise children alone or cancer. But we can find the good in what God does to and for us in these circumstances. Don't run from it. I would even say push toward it, lean into it. Don't try to fix it for me or anyone else. Sit in the ashes with each other. We will be reformed. As you take this bread and cup today, remember, celebrate, and let God reform you. And relish taking it together, for I long to be with you. Let's pray. Father God, thank you from the depths of our hearts for coming to earth, becoming human, staying human, suffering, dying, and most of all, for rising again to intercede on our behalf to the King of Kings and Lord of Lords. Glory to your name.
Uh, test, I, mean, I, I don't think it's inappropriate to, to, to say thank you to the worship team for using their giftedness in the way they lead us. I, I, I think it's important to remember, outside of Savannah, everyone, everyone you see on Sundays besides Savannah and Cole are volunteers in this ministry that, that show up early, stay late, uh, go through a lot of rehearsals and work to, to do this for us. And I just want to acknowledge that for, for just a second. Um, there are five ways to give uh, for transitions. How about that? There are five ways to give at, at Otter Creek. You can, you can see the, the ways on, on the screen there behind me. Uh, fun fact, we, we've been in budget season around here. We, we are a July 1 to June 30 budget cycle here at Otter Creek. And so we've been prepping for the upcoming budget the last few weeks. Um, fun fact is we, we spend uh, between this building and our OC West End campus about $13,000 a month on electricity. So to put that in, you know, localized terms, that, that's about eight Labradoodles a month. <laughs> but paying those bills keeps the lights on for 30 plus 12 step groups that use our buildings every single week. The, that powers the AC for our two preschools and the hundreds of students and staff that use those buildings five days a week. That serves literally thousands who gather Monday through Saturday to study the Bible in this building, whether that's our worship services, whether that's Bible study fellowship on Mondays or on Wednesdays or the ladies' Bible class on Tuesdays or our granddaughters on Wednesday afternoons, a lot of people. It powers the gym and the kitchen that serve room in the inn all winter long, church league sports, community practices, numerous special events during the week. It leaves lights on for our six campus partners. Those are the nonprofits who have full-time office space in our West End campus. It gives meeting spaces to metro schools, community forums, social clubs, all those others who use our facilities to build community every day of the week. And it sounds like a lot of money, and those of us who get to see it used all week long have a lot of gratitude for the way this building gets used. I hope you're able to connect not just to these buildings, but to the people that are drawn into these spaces on each and every day. This church uh, is way more than a building but these buildings are also way more than a church. Your gifts and your willingness to put skin in the game does more than keep the lights on. It brings life, it brings belonging, it brings a very safe place for a lot of people. It brings a hopeful place. So we say thank you for your generosity. May we all be compelled to give as we've been blessed to share, as we feel prompted and to be filled with gratitude along the way. Let's pray together. Lord Jesus, thank you for these gifts. Thank you for the gifters. Thank you for the giftedness represented in this room, and we offer this day and these gifts to you. Through Jesus we pray, amen. Last week, I spent several minutes in the teaching time walking us through what I would call a paradigm text, a text that defines 
the cultural moment that we're in with the decline of Christianity in the United States. Some people call this post-modernity. Some people call this a post-Christian context. Some call it secularization. It goes by many names, but it's trying to identify this tension that we experience in American culture between theism and atheism or theism and agnosticism. And Dr. John Lennox, while he doesn't represent exactly how I feel, he does get to the heart of the problem that C.S. Lewis spent most of his life trying to explain to Christians. Here's how he describes this. Religion is a fairy tale for people afraid of the dark. Atheism is a fairy tale for people afraid of the light. C.S. Lewis said, just as the Christian has to answer the problem of suffering what in theology we call theodicy. Where is God in the midst of so much pain, violence, and death in the world? The atheist has to account for joy, hope, and the presence of a newborn baby in a family. See, each approach, theism and atheism, is trying to tell a meta-narrative, an undergirding story of not only how we got here, but who put us here and for what purpose. And so I suggested in these post-resurrection appearances of Jesus that part of what the New Testament is trying to answer are the same questions that we are dealing with today regarding faith and doubt, deconstruction and reconstruction, life and death, despair and human flourishing. Laced throughout the story of humanity is the story of God's people in the midst of creation trying to name for people what it means to live a beautiful and a meaningful life in which you have to tell no lies. And so the Emmaus Road appearance story enters into that. And so I know some of you are keenly leaning in on deconstruction and reconstruction because of your own faith journey, a spouse who's going through it, a child or a grandchild. I know some who are here just for this series and you're like, I'm out after this series. And what I just want to encourage all of us to think about occurred to me on one of my many walks in Meadow Lake, the neighborhood right next to this campus. I am confidently entering into middle age, which means I go for a lot of walks. I'm not quite a bird watcher yet, but I do feel myself on that trajectory. Retirement of pickup basketball, walker, mall walker, bird watching. I think that's how it goes typically. But in this neighborhood next to this campus, there's this amazing thing happening. It's been happening for several years now. Demolition on these beautiful properties. Can you imagine the city of Brentwood, not to mention the HOA of Medele, dealing with people who only wanted to demolish the homes, but not build anything beautiful on top of it? What I'm saying is that deconstruction, for the sake of deconstruction, is demolition. But deconstruction, for the sake of reconstruction, is called Christian maturity. The same thing that you believed about God when you were seven might not be enough for navigating your adult life. Meaning God reveals God's self to you as a child, as a teenager, in ways that we can understand and appreciate. But when you lose your mother to cancer, when your spouse walks out on you, if you've buried a child in your family, some of the things that you believed about God when you were seven don't hold up to the weight of the scrutiny of suffering. And that's just called growing up in faith having a deeper, more robust understanding of the mystery of God. And so I suggested over the last few weeks that we have to be ruthlessly committed to letting the stories of Scripture, which I will say over and over again, are smarter than you and they're smarter than me. And that is a fundamental beginning point of Christian faith that these stories know the human condition and the human heart better than you do who had one class in psychology in undergrad. The reason that these stories have stood the test of time, thousands of years of men and women's collective wisdom under the guidance of the Holy Spirit, the reason these scriptures have stood the test of time is they tell the truth in hopeful ways about what it means to follow God. And so I suggested that as these two people in Luke 24 are 
in a serious season of deconstruction, they are completely befuddled, confused, angry, sad, as they're leaving Jerusalem and Passover, thinking that they believed one thing about God and now everything's been undermined, that that snapshot of these two on the road is the snapshot for the cultural moment that we're in, in Europe and the United States. And as Jesus approaches those two on the road in their deconstruction, in their season of doubt, he playfully asks them questions. He speaks directly to them about scripture. And then through the form of their hospitality and the breaking of the bread and the giving of the wine, he reveals himself in the full manifestation of his glory in the midst of their faith and doubt. Jesus is not nearly as afraid of other people's questions and doubts as the church has been. Because Jesus knew the Father. And according to Jesus, the Father has big shoulders. The Father's been holding planet Earth and all creation together for thousands of years. He can handle the questions and the doubts that you bring. So part of what this story is about, some observers note, that the space between this religious experience of Passover and the journey to their home is called liminality. They're in transition. They're stuck. They don't belong. They don't want to go back to where they were, but they don't know what the future looks like. And that describes a lot of people that I know living in a liminal space. It's like having to live in an airport for a year. How terrible would that be? Yes, I've seen the movies. Someone asked me after the eight for it. How terrible would that be to have no place no standing by which you can plant deep roots and allow the leaves and the branches to flourish. That's liminality. And that's the context of deconstruction in which Jesus approaches these two on the road to Emmaus. And so I suggested the sobering truth that we have to understand both the decline numerically and the reasons why for Christianity in the United States. 90% of all churches, Roman and Catholic, are smaller today than they were 10 years ago. 90%. It doesn't matter if you're Baptist, Pentecostal, Presbyterian, Church of Christ. This decline is not interested in denominational nuance. The church that I grew up in when I was a child was 1,000 people. You guys, in Michigan, a church of Christ of 1,000 people is a super mega church. That church today is significantly smaller than it was even 15 years ago. You can look just around churches of Christ in Middle Tennessee, Baptist churches of Christ, Baptist church. I'm sure there are those. I haven't been to one, but that, there's a marketing idea. <laughs> Nashville. But Baptists and churches of Christ have, ex have experienced significant loss over the last 10 or 15 years. If you look at the churches who were considered the quote flagship churches in the Methodist church, the Baptist church and the churches of Christ, many of those churches in middle Tennessee are significantly smaller than they were 15 and 20 years ago. If you look at church membership among Protestant churches in America from 1930 to 1990, church membership was relatively flat. 70% of Americans identified with a Christian congregation. Beginning in 1990, that number significantly declined to the point that in 2020, a Pew Forum survey indicates that 46% of Americans now identify as a member of a local church. I'm not talking about going to church, serving in a church, Bible study fellowship, Wednesday night church where the varsity Christians hang. I'm not talking about that, right? I'm talking about, do you even consider yourself a member of a local church? That number from 1990 was 70%. And now in the year 2020, 30 years later, that number is 46%. If you pay attention to Fox News or CNN or Newsweek or the Wall Street Journal, the New York Times, you will see articles about the rise of the N-O-N-E-S, the rise of the nuns. Those who identify as atheist, agnostic, or completely indifferent to religion. In 1990, 6% of American adults identified as a nun, N-O-N-E. That number is now 26% of American adults identify as a nun, the fastest growing demographic among American adults. That's the sobering reality, that as Christianity around the world does exceedingly well, 
both in Catholicism and charismatic Pentecostal churches in South America, in Africa, in different parts of Asia. As the church grows in other parts of the world, the soil in America has become hardened. That's just a fact. And the facts don't care about your feelings. The facts are what they are. But the interesting question, as we try and take a text like Luke 24, again, which I tried to explain the theology of it in great detail last week. What I want to do this week is explain the why of how American Christianity has gotten into this situation. And this is the hard part. Last night, I'm going through my notes. I'm like, why do I get myself into series like this? I should just preach the Proverbs. (laughs) And I choose this. I choose these hard things, right? And this is what's hard to hear about this. Anything that is 2,000 years old, like the church, is going to have health problems. And so while the church has accomplished amazing things in the world, and I try and talk about those consistently, the advent of leprosoriums, the whole idea of adoption in the Roman Empire of those children who were born with Down syndrome and cleft palates, that's all out of Judaism and Christianity. Universities that were started in this country to train men and women for missions and preaching like Harvard, Yale, and Princeton. Hospitals, which are named after the saints. Like Christianity has accomplished amazing things. And if you talk to someone who can't name those amazing things, they're not being honest about history. But the other side of that is that the rose has many thorns. And some people only want to talk about the rose petal and not the thorns. And what we have to talk about in America is why Christianity is struggling amongst urban and suburban citizens. So as I've tried to read and listen and study and think and do informal and formal surveys among members of our church, here are some of the conclusions that I'm currently living with. Number one, One of the reasons people are breaking up with their local church, not necessarily breaking up with God, but one of the reasons people are losing or leaving their local church is the simple reality of human apathy. For instance, I can't tell you how many people I ate lunch with during COVID who said, your sermons are a lot better when I'm at home in my PJs eating my cereal. It's so nice to have my Sundays back, man. I get that. And some are opting out. I'd just rather go to the lake house than deal with all this church business. I'd I'd rather just pour all the money into my kids' sports than have to deal with all this church business. And there is a reality where people had their schedules reset to say, I want my full Saturdays and Sundays. I don't want to mess with all that. That's just a harsh reality. And every church I know has dealt with this, including our own. Another reason that some people break up with their local church. He said dramatically, partisan idolatry. Mainline Protestant churches tend to identify with the left and the Democratic Party. And conservative evangelical churches tend to identify with the right or the Republican Party. And what's happening among 30 and 20-somethings, and the data is consistent From Los Angeles to New York City, from Detroit to Houston, the data is consistent. 30 and 20-somethings are opting out of churches who say we're apolitical, wink, wink, but mainline in the bag for the left and conservative evangelicals who push everything on the right or the Republican Party. And you can try and defend being a Democrat and being a Christian, or you can try and say, well, obviously God would be a Republican. And the 30-year-olds and the the 30-somethings and the 20-somethings are saying, I've read your Gospels. If you think that the brown-skinned Jew from Palestine has everything to do with your party, we're talking about a book only one of us has read. And so they're voting quietly with their feet to say, if I have to be a Democrat to be a Christian, or if I have to be a Republican to be your kind of Christian, thank you, I'd just rather go to brunch. And they're doing it en masse. And these are not Like just anecdotes, I've had conversations with so many who fit that category, who just want to know, is there a third way church out there? Is there a church out there that will not be co-opted by the current political debates of the day? Yes, to talk about them, but not to be co-opted. Another reason why some people break up with their local church 
and this is difficult for me because it wasn't my experience, but this is the experience of some of you is family toxicity. You grew up in a family in which religion was toxic. And you grew up in a family where there were secrets and there were abuse and there was shame. And then you came to church and everyone had to look the perfect part. And so your family life didn't match your church life. Your church life made it look like you were just so, had it all together. And then the family life was a mess. And when you're 10, you're an amazing recorder and a terrible interpreter. That's what child psychologists teach us. And so when you become adult, you recognize that your view of God has been misinformed by toxic family culture. And so what some people are calling deconstruction is actually family trauma. And the church gets wrapped up into it. And it's an incredibly sensitive and tender thing to navigate with people as they enter into adulthood. They have children and grandchildren and they think about, well, what is my legacy going to be with those who I'm responsible to lead and to love? Some people break up with their church because they experience church trauma, secrets, lies, The pastor embezzles a bunch of money. The board lies, covers up sexual abuse. This happens in churches all over America. And that's a traumatic psychological event. So some people say, I'm not breaking up with God, but I am breaking up with the trauma that I've experienced. Some people break up with their local church because of true intellectual rigor. I've had a couple of friends in my life that I grew up with from elementary school who I'm still friends with but they would say, Christianity worked for me until it didn't. And I wish I could say, well, they just left because they're lazy. That's not the case with some people. They've studied, they've done the work, they've debated. I've debated with them, long conversations. And some people come to a decision. And I think the role of the church for those who have pursued true intellectual rigor and said, I can't be a Christian anymore. I think it's our job as Christians to say, well, our friendship is not dependent upon your belief. I love you. Like I'm in friendship with you. And whether or not you're part of our church or not, or whether or not you're going through this faith crisis, dark night of the soul, does not change how I'm going to treat you. We'll be here. I'll be here for you no matter what you go through. Some people break up with the church. This is really important to understand culturally because they are disillusioned with all the institutions that comprise the United States. Like there's a spirit in which the church shouldn't be defensive because all institutions are under scrutiny. Banks, governments, politicians. Now you're like, okay, I'm with you now, right? There's a suspicion of all overarching institutions going all the way back to the Vietnam War and debates between those who were making decisions and those soldiers who went to serve, the civil rights movement of the 1960s. And all of a sudden, institutions are called into great questioning by citizens of America. And so, of course, the church gets lumped into that. Scandals in the Catholic Church, scandals in the Baptist Church, scandals everywhere you look gets identified and partnered with or paired with institutions to the degree that many Americans today believe that all institutions are inherently evil. I don't believe that's true, but I am honest enough to recognize if there are 100 or 150 million people in America who think that way, then the church has a significant uphill battle to represent Jesus with our structures and our buildings and our programs. And if we don't approach that with a deep, believable sense of humility, we will never get a hearing with those who have walked away and broken up with their local church. Some people break up with their local church because of a diminishing focus on Jesus and his red letters. They're in a dogmatic doctrinal context where someone just wants to debate the meaning of an obscure text from second Kings. And they're like, I barely got here today. I wanna talk about real stuff. I wanna talk about faith. I wanna talk about doubt. I wanna talk about my kids. I wanna talk about my marriage. I wanna talk about love and friendship. I don't wanna debate some obscure text in Leviticus. Some have broken up with the church and this one seems, these next two seems to be increasing greatly the last seven or eight years, but some have broken up with the church because they believe that they heard a message that you can't be a person of faith and science. And some of our smartest people in our churches have said, I thought Jesus said, love the Lord your God with your whole self, 
your heart, soul, mind, and strength. I thought we bring our whole bodies into this faith. And yet, even going back 100 years ago in Dayton, Tennessee, you can do this research on your own with the Scopes Monkey Trial, in which evangelicals essentially said, you either believe in God or you believe in science. And some of us have said, what if faith and science are two ways of talking about the same God? The most significant scientific achievement of the last 50 years is the Human Genome Project. If you don't know about this, it is fascinating to think about what we've learned at a cellular, molecular, DNA structure level about human, humanity. Nature, nurture, brown eyes, blue eyes, temperament, height, weight, all the things that make humans interesting. The leader of the Human Genome Project is a devout theist who follows the teachings of Jesus named Francis Collins. I am so thankful that Collins in the public sphere is representing the very best of Christianity, which has always historically believed that we do not choose between the language of faith and science. They are two ways of talking about the same Father and Son and Holy Spirit. And churches who will not allow scientific questions and debates about creation and science and the body and nature and nurture and having these deep discussions, we will drive out people who want to love God with their whole minds. Some people break up with their church because they have seen in psychology what's called projection or scapegoating. Meaning instead of churches being ruthlessly committed to dealing with our own sin of greed and lust and apathy and racism and whatever the sins are that are in this room and in me right now, that instead of dealing with our own sins, that some churches are more focused and hyper fixated on calling non-Christian to Christian standards instead of calling Christians to Jesus standards. And they said, why are you so worried about people who are not believers living like Jesus when you yourself have this giant plank and you're walking around bumping into everything. Instead of focusing on the plank, you're fixated on the speck. Now, despite everything I just said, which might be the most depressing 10 minutes of a sermon I've ever preached in my adult life, anything that's 2,000 years old is going to have some health problems. A church that is 95 years old, like Otter Creek, is going to have some health problems. So the physician is saying, the body is healthy. There's vitality, there's ministry, there's energy, there's life, there's serving. But you have to know your context where the body is operating. And where the body is operating, where the church is operating in the year of our Lord 2024, where 90% of churches are smaller than they were 10 or 15 years ago, you've got to be ruthlessly committed to sobriety of telling the truth about how hard the next 20 years will be in leading a local church. When I think about Jesus approaching these two friends who are in the season of deconstruction, trying to decide if they believe any of it. I take great comfort in the fact that Jesus offers them his relationship, his body, his conversation, his time, his patience, his mind, trusting that by being faithful to those friends in that evening experience, that God would open their eyes and that they would be able to see Jesus for who he really is. And I think that short story is the perfect parable. I think it historically happened, but it's the perfect metaphor for where we find ourselves today. And so over the next several weeks, we are going to hear from different voices who have been on this journey, who are going to approach this subject with a rigorous commitment to truth, but a passion for hope and joy. And so my invitation to you is as you think about your own life and all those things that I just listed, use that as a way to check in with yourself. Where are you in this journey? How do you feel about church generally, generally and your commitment to this church specifically? Some of you have friends that you're like, I'm afraid to bring them to Otter Creek because I don't know what y'all are gonna say. 
And I'm like, I know, I don't know what the preacher's gonna say some Sundays. I know that feeling. Some of you have family members that you will only bring to Otter Creek because of things that they've heard at other churches. So I know, like, this is in your kitchen. This is where you live. The people who are important to you, collectively as a body, when we allow these stories like Emmaus Road to guide us, instead of being weighed down by cynicism and despair as the two experienced early in the journey, the hallmark of people who have been with Jesus are hope and joy. Hope and joy will always be more compelling to people than your right answers, than your sophisticated presentations, and your passion for deconstruction. And so, God, we pray, Father and Son and Holy Spirit, would you give us this sense of faith and joy and hope and love, and peace and patience and kindness and goodness and gentleness and self-control, so that when others are in proximity to us, they might have an encounter with Jesus that they had not considered. And God, would you be gentle and gracious with us for all the ways that we fall short, for all the ways that we've contributed to the decline of faith in our cities? Would you give us the courage and the hope and the joy to reconsider our own callings and vocation as part of the way that you spread the kingdom? As we pray the way Jesus taught us to pray, our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not to temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. As you venture into your week, We will have shepherds available to pray with you in the prayer room in the very back. Go in the grace and the peace of our Lord. And the whole church said together, amen. Go in peace.